You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. It was a call centre mm-hmm. um, that was taking inbound um, sales calls for like private customers and business customers as well. So I never, I didn't start doing it straight away, but after a, a week or two there, I was obviously receiving all these calls and then you would go on the computer and type the customer's details in and then they would pay with a card or whatever. So you would take card details. And then I just started thinking, well, I wonder what, you know, could be done with these card details. There is one point, I guess, where things did change quite considerably and that was when when I started realising that corporate cards were, you know, the, the key to making huge purchases. So the biggest thing that I ever bought um, in terms of value would have been a BMW 7 Series I bought when I lived when I lived in Belfast but the thing was I never actually ever picked up the car so I remember one night I was in Miami and I was only there for three nights but I stayed at this like really swanky hotel in Miami and arranged for like a limousine to take me out to go to these clubs it would be quite common for me to go into a bar or nightclub and like just order champagne for everyone um, but I think maybe the biggest bar tab I ever had somewhere was about maybe £20,000. Whenever I was staying at a hotel, um, whenever I returned to the hotel room after being out, I would chap the door and I would just say, housekeeping, just to see if there was anyone in the room. Because obviously I didn't, you know, I knew that if they were going to try and catch me at a hotel, that's where they'd be waiting. So this one time I got back to the hotel in Toronto and I was carrying hundreds of bags of shopping. Um, didn't chap the door, just walked in. Boom, busted. In your room? Yeah. Basically, I, well, I didn't get busted though, properly, because mm-hmm. I knew they were there. I heard walkie-talkies going, so I dropped everything and just ran. Boom, we're on. <laughs> yes. All right. And today's guest, we've got Elliot Castro. How are you, Elliot? I'm perfect, mate. It's good to be here. Thanks it's for having me. Good to be here, mate. Actually, somebody sent me a message just last week a bit of video on Vice Scottish boy fraud <laughs> millions of pounds travelling the world you end up getting to jail in Canada you end up phoning them up and pretending you were the embassy and you end up managing to get back home it's like a catch me if you can kind of thing and you're no state you stay pretty close to me Glasgow boy just across the water mate aye <laughs> wrong side of the city maybe aye. some might say <laughs> how's life life's life's good mate aye aye it's interesting just now with what's going on, but aye, life's good. It's weird time, isn't it? It's very strange, mate. Mm-hmm. Very, very strange. Not, I can't say I'm enjoying that side of things, but just trying to keep my head straight and and, and just get on with what I need to do for myself, aye, mate. Fair you know? play, so, mate. And all you hang weekend days, just kick on and keep your head above water. But it's a very interesting story. The Vice thing, how did that come about? Because that's recently new. So I got a message off uh, Vice about, when was it? Must have been some sort of summertime uh, last year. It was, it was a an agent, one of, one of my agents. I've got a couple of agents that look after my speaking engagements and things like that. And uh, I get a, a message off uh, um, one of them last summer, asking, saying that Vice had been in touch and asking if they were happy for me to give them my number. So the guy got in touch. Um, it was supposed to be basically. I've I've turned down a lot of these things in the past, you know, because I mean I know I'm sitting here with you just now, but there is a part of me that kind of just wants to forget about it. But at the end of the day, I really can't, you know. It's just one of these things. But the long, long, long short of it was that they got in touch and said that they were wanting to do a podcast, or not a podcast, a documentary. It would be a five, ten minute thing. Um, they sent me this really cool, kind of upbeat thing about a, an old art forger from years ago. The guy was about 70 or something, but he was just telling his stories about his forgeries that he'd done. And it was great. I thought if, the, if it's anything like that, then I'm happy with that, you know. And because it was Vice, I thought oh, it'll just be quite lighthearted and stuff. And then obviously it dropped and I was absolutely devastated, if I'm totally honest with you. How come? Well, they made it seem dead sinister. Just a lot of people have said that they don't think there's anything that bad about it, but it just wasn't really what I was expecting, you know. I mean, I'm not expecting me paint me as some kind of hero or whatever but it was just um, the music was dead sinister that was another thing um, so they, they promised me that they would use some of my music in the video and that never happened so a few things they said they were going to do basically so see to be honest with you James I should have known better because at the end of the day they're journalists you know yeah, yeah. and and, and that's no turning back now it's got nearly no, 10 million so, views but I know. it's yeah. good for platforms it's good to, for getting mm-hmm. your name out there because you're now trying to do good which we'll touch on all <coughs> that stuff but I always go back to the start with my guests, mm-hmm. where you grew up and how it all began. Right, so, um, well, 
I grew up, I was, I was born in Aberdeen, actually. Um, we, we don't really talk about that very oh, often. No. <laughs> I, was bo- I was born in Aberdeen, don't get me wrong, still get family there, etc. My dad's actually Italian by birth, but his his family emigrated to South America when he was a wee boy. So all his family, all my dad's side of the family are over there. So we went over there, spent a bit of time over there. My mum decided she didn't like it. <laughs> I think the plan was we were meant to be staying there, uh-huh. and it didn't happen. So we came back to Glasgow. Um, and uh, I was only, what, six years old when we came back? Five and a half, six years old or something like that. So just just in time to start school, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and I grew up in the south side of the city, um area called Battlefield. Uh, Shite hole. <laughs> <laughs> don't know about that. I think that's maybe a wee bit harsh, James. <laughs> nah. But uh, that's, that's where I grew up anyway. Um, so school life was... Bit crazy for me because I've really found it hard to get on with other kids my own age. Very How come? so. This is a question I've asked myself many times, and it's only as an adult really that I think I've been able to actually um, truthfully answer that. You know, uh, I was I was definitely a bit different. There's no doubt about that. You know, I was quite smart as well, and I just found it like the things that other kids laughed at. I just didn't find them funny. You know, it was like they laugh about things like uh, you know. Do you ever get naked? I when you're in the shower, obviously, and, and that to them was hilarious when I responded with that, you know, and that just seemed normal to me. Obviously, if you're having a shower, you're going to be you're going to be naked, aren't you? So, but it was just little things like that would would cause them to have fits of laughter and just little things, as I say. And it just I just found it difficult to get on with other kids' money. I found it a lot easier actually to get on with adults when I was a kid. You know, just better conversations I found. Um, so that caused me a lot of problems. Intelligent, younger. Age. I would say so. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I was I certainly was good at my work. I never had any problems with that. I was always passed passed all my tests and everything. And you know, I really wanted to be the best at that side of things. But in the classroom, most of the time there was no bother at all. It was just outside the classroom. So I ended up being a, a total loner when I was at school, uh, which was very very hard. Um, at primary school, I uh, got bullied quite a bit at primary school. Um, into secondary school started off as well and then until one day I just leathered this boy outside he was trying to be- beat me up basically and I'd never never done that before because I wasn't that type of person to, I wouldn't like hitting people and stuff you know but this I don't know something just snapped that day I was about 12 or 13 years old um, and uh, I leathered this boy and my history teacher who was a really really good guy came out and basically seen what was going on uh, got suspended straight away obviously for you know what I'd done but nobody ever tried to try to beat me up again still mm-hmm. nobody still nobody spoke to me <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. but but nobody tried to hit me that was for sure yeah because you're you a know? big boy man you're about six feet odds I'm six two aye. yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. it's funny how people try and pick on the biggest or the tallest I know. that could be something to do with it you know, you know what I mean yeah. being a bit inferior a bit intimidated yeah. did you feel better after you released a bit of anger <laughs> Uh, I remember feeling fantastic. Yeah. Um. Just, I, I think it was just obviously that had been pent up for you know years of having that kind of experience at school. Mm-hmm. So, um. But after it, yeah, I did feel better. I mean, I learned a really important lesson, which is just you can't let people fuck with you. You know, one percent people can so, only get pushed into a corner aye. too much before they snap and mm-hmm. try and stick up for themselves. And uh, for any bullies, I, I don't like yeah. bullies. I like the underdog, and I like people. I don't like people mm-hmm. trying to shit off people. Mm-hmm. But saying that's. It's just a weird time mm. and everybody kind of, everybody's kind of out for themselves just now. Yeah. So after schooling and stuff, how did you get into, did you get into work or anything? So I left away? school when I was 16. Um, bearing in mind, I went to eight different schools because I kept getting suspended or expelled for stupid shit, basically. Really, really. When you think back on some of it, like it was one time I got suspended for stealing a Christmas decoration off a tree mm-hmm. at school. So you, you become know. a bit of a problem child? Aye. After oh, definitely. The, after that yeah. fight? Or was uh-huh. it? No, I mean, it was. It already started by that mm-hmm. point, you know. But the same thing, basically I had this routine where I'd go to a new school and everything would be, would be absolutely cool for a couple of weeks, maybe a few months or whatever. But eventually the same problems would, would come up again, you know, just um, I would get on fine with other kids to begin with. And then over time I would just, I don't know, I, don't, I, don't, I can't really remember exactly, mm-hmm. you know, the pro- progression of what happened. But that's basically the kind of stuff. It was all stupid shit and like stealing a decoration off a Christmas tree or uh, there was one time I... Um, wrote something rude about a teacher on the computer and printed stuff out and put like distributed it around the school mm. like it done for that basically it was just mm. really stupid you Good know stuff i basically but it was just stuff that no other kid would even dream of doing yeah do you know what i mean so you're doing that to get attention you're doing that to make friends or be liked i think there was a party it was that but obviously i had a really a, a really overactive imagination as well 
I mean, like I was always just. I mean, when I was a kid, like I used to like steal my mum's bed sheets and like dress up as a pope and stuff like that. <laughs> just fucking crazy yeah. stuff. Do you know what I mean? Um, and or just find like you know something like that and dress up like a king. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Just all these kind of things. So it was always like pretending. Probably because I wasn't really very happy. I was. I think I was probably yeah. just always trying to pretend to be something I wasn't. Mm-hmm. So I think there's, you know, if you look at what happened after, there's a, a large part of it that's that's definitely got something to do with that. Yeah. You know? So your first job then, what was uh, that? So when I left school, the first job I had was working in a call centre. Um, I managed to. I, I shouldn't have been working because I don't think I was actually old enough um, to do it to, to be in that job. I think you had to be at least sixteen years old or at least 18 or whatever it was. It was either 18 or 16, and I basically lied about it, because either way, I wasn't I wasn't 18, you know. So they gave me a job. It was working for a mobile phone network, um, and it was my first, like, experience of a work environment. So I couldn't believe I'd managed to get the job, to be honest with you, because it was like, there's no way I'm getting this job, and I got offered it, so... But that was, that was kind of... Um, like so, basically, that's kind of where it where it started getting a bit more serious with the the fraud stuff, you know. So that started from a very early age. Yeah. So I mean, it actually started before that. I mean, the first the first time that I can remember, and I'm pretty sure this was the first time uh, doing anything like that, anything illegal to do with cards or whatever, um, was I found a card on a train. Somebody had obviously just dropped their card, um, and obviously back then you you only had to sign for things. It wasn't there was no chip and pin. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking back 1996 or something like that. No, in fact, it wouldn't have been. So the late nineties, anyway, mid to late nineties, um, and I found this card, and I was like, right, I'm going to try and buy my ticket with this card, and it's, I, you know, it's obviously seen the signature on it. I was like, that's going to be very easy to copy. So when the guy came round, because the whole point of this was I had money to buy my ticket, and I was like, I'll be able to keep the money and use it for something else. Mm-hmm. So the guy came round, and I gave, hand him the the credit card, and he printed out a voucher. I've signed the voucher, um, but unbeknownst to me he'd spied obviously my photo card had the, my own name on it and this card had somebody else's I don't even remember the name to be honest with you it's that long ago but it had somebody else's name on it so he'd spied that but he hadn't said anything about it and then so I thought everything was good you know I was like yes got away with that and then we stopped the train stopped at like call winning or something like that and uh, two police officers came on right we need a word with you son <laughs> So I try to, try to tell them it was like my my friend's uncle's card or some really stupid story, um, and I think they did believe me at first, you know, probably because I was so young. They were like, "That's surely not." But anyway, they've radioed in, and it's turned out the card has been reported lost. So <laughs> that didn't that work. Was the start. So that was the start. <laughs> the very first start of journey. Thought you were getting away. Did that never make you want to? stop then that you get caught your very first time um i never will see at that point obviously i never thought that that i never thought it would happen again do you know what i mean it wasn't like i was saying right i'm gonna make a career out of this what happened was the police took me up to the, the school it was like kind of i was at a boarding school monday to friday sort of thing um and the police took me up to the school and told um it was like a the, the you know the, the the sort of head teacher woman there basically and um, she was absolutely raging. She was like, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to help you. So, I mean, this was a school for, for children who had problems, basically, mm-hmm. right? So um, it was a residential unit, so it was like a house, basically. But there was like three three different rooms, three bedrooms, and uh, three three kids stayed there. Like older, te- like, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, teenagers sort of thing. So um, she was she was quite annoyed. And I, I can kind of see, looking back on it, I can see they were trying to do everything they could for me, you know, but I was just too far gone I, was, I don't think there was anything Andy could have done for me then, ah, anything, no I hadn't touched time. hadn't touched anything like that at that point like literally didn't even drink anything at that time um, so I, d- I didn't have my first drink till I was like well I didn't, I didn't get pissed if, until I was 18 mm. <laughs> so I was good that way but that's not bad you just followed at least one rule <laughs> I know that's it mm. makes, it makes a change you know so you started working in the phone shop mm-hmm. is that when you started getting other people's details and <clears throat> aye so it was a, it was a call centre mm. um, it was taking inbound um, sales calls for like private customers and business customers as well so I never and I didn't start doing it straight away but after a, a week or two there I was obviously receiving all these calls and then you would go on the computer and type the customers details in and then they would pay with a card or whatever so you would take card details and then I just started thinking well I wonder what you know could be done with these card details so I started writing things down uh, obviously by this point you know I had a couple of other encounters with using cards and stuff so I, I realised that 
if you were going to get away with using them, that you would have to know certain things about the customer. Because this was back in the day when sometimes if you went into a shop and used a card, it would basically give a message to the whoever was putting the transaction through that they had to phone the bank and it would ask questions like your mother's maiden name and all these sorts of things. You don't get that so much now because it is all chip and pin, you know, mm-hmm. but back then that was quite common. So um, I started writing down things, but what I would do is basically tell the customer that their card has been referred to the bank, so can you just hold for a minute? So I'd put them on hold and then I would come back to them and say, right, um, the bank are asking for some more information just for security reasons. And I would start asking them, you know, mother's maiden name, uh, passwords, just whatever whatever I thought would be helpful, you know. Um, and then quite often they would they would just give it, no problem at all. In fact, I don't think there was a single time they didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, it would probably be very different now because people are a lot more aware of no security players. and stuff now, more Aye, red flags yeah. everywhere. So but, that was the very start then, just when you got everybody's information, when you were going to swipe, mm-hmm. if they'd made the phone call, you had all the details to yeah. clarify it was you, basically. Basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would have all the information, or not all, always have all the information, but I would have the questions. It used to be very standard questions that they would ask you. You know, like mother's maiden name, date of birth, address, uh, postcode. Address, postcode maybe, your, maybe the name of your employer or something like that. But the questions were all very standard, you know. And that was basically something that I used to my advantage because I knew that regardless of which bank the card belonged to, the chances are that at least two or three of those questions would be asked. Um, but over time, I mean, you've got to remember I did this hundreds of times. So I began to understand exactly what questions were asked by which banks, even to the point where I would know from the first six or eight digits of the card number what bank it was. You know, not always if it was like a, like a foreign bank or something, I maybe wouldn't, wouldn't know that one. Was it? After a certain limit that you spent, say you maybe spent over 300 or 500 that would phone through, or was it just random? So it was it was either completely random, which they would do from time to time, or if they, their system had picked up an unusual spending pattern, then you, they would sometimes request a, it was what's called a referral, basically. So a referral um, would be done either completely random or based on, you know, unusual spending, or if it was a particularly high transaction, perhaps as well. Yeah, so you started doing this every day? What, taking details? Yeah. Aye, so I was doing it pretty much every single I mean, I literally had a notebook mm-hmm. filled with details. Um, and by the point when I, when I, well, what actually happened was I went in one day and I'd been late a few times. And the reason I'd been late is because I was out drinking. So <laughs> by this point, um, I was out uh, drinking and came in late one day and that was it. I was I was told I was sacked. So they sacked you for drinking but no fraud? No, they sacked me for being late. <laughs> Fuck's sake. I know. So, see when you, if there's, is it not register that say 50 people report fraud on their accounts, could they know track that that was coming for a certain company or like a certain mm-hmm. uh, voice, uh, call centre? Or a, yeah. So, see now they would probably have the software to do that and it would pick it up very quickly. Mm-hmm. But as I say, things were so different back then. You know, there was, there was certainly an amount of fraud, but it wasn't the same as it is now. Just in terms of you know fraud detection procedures are a lot more um, pin they're able to pinpoint like you say you know if you've got fifty cards and they've all had fraud from a certain but they've all been used in a certain place within the last month or two then it can say well you know it might be something to do with that but what you've also got to remember is that every bank will have their own records and where the banks let themselves down sometimes is that they don't share information now there's several reasons for that number one is for you know economic reasons they don't want their competitors maybe to know what's going on with their business so that's one side of it but the other point is as well to do with like data protection so a lot of banks won't want to share information because it's not allowed simply can't do it but there are ways around that you know mm-hmm. so some of the work I've done since I, since I came out of prison you know was was to do with helping banks and um, I've done work with the Metropolitan Police and Scotland Yard and stuff like that as well just trying to help them kind of close the loopholes or maybe work together better because mm-hmm. there's ways it could be done you know they could share information without sharing private customer information it's just yeah. a case of making it work so what did you do after you get sacked in so did you think that was game over or did you just want to keep going and find another job where you can no. get details so after i got sacked um i had that i had that book so i knew i was going to i knew i was going to do something with it um, by this point, I was having a lot of um, issues with my parents because I was coming in late and they weren't happy. Do you know what I mean? I was coming in stupid. Did they know what you were doing? No, they didn't. At that point, they didn't have a clue. 
Um, did they ever see new clothes and think, new jewellery and yeah. think where did you get that so from? There, there were a few times where they did see new items appearing which you know generally speaking I wouldn't have been able to afford um, but they did you know kind of half believe me I think when I told them that it was you know causing my, my, my wages from work mm. Um, but I mean, it, see, the thing is, James, at that point, I wasn't really buying like really flash stuff. You know, this wasn't like a, I wasn't getting into Louis Vuitton, Armani and stuff like that at this point. You know, that came later. The stuff I was buying back then was like maybe um, like the clothes, but not nothing fancy, you know, yeah. like in, maybe getting into Top Man or something like that or Burton's or whatever. And then um, like music stuff, CDs or going for a haircut and stuff like that. So it wasn't, you know. There wasn't anything really too flash happening at that point. Um, when did you start thinking, right, I need to up the ante here and <laughs> just start moving through the gears then Aye. going for bigger things instead of a couple of hundred quid here, a couple of hundred quid there? Did you see that you could progress? Yeah, so I, I don't I don't think it was something that happened overnight. I think it was just more a case of I became more aware of the potential of these, these, these cards as in, you know, I knew that I could buy things that were a bit more expensive. So... Um, Wait, I think with there is one point I guess where things did change quite considerably, and that was when when I started realizing that corporate cards were you know the the key to making huge purchases. Um, so the reason is because if you imagine you know like a, a boss is taking away his staff for a conference or something like that, it wouldn't be unusual for them to be spending you know maybe five grand on air flights or you know three thousand pound in a hotel or something like that because it's a corporate card. Um, and some banks, um, one one in particular, had this feature where you could actually phone them and tell them how much you were going to spend. So you could phone them and, I mean, obviously, as long as you pass security, you say, right, um, I've got this thing that's coming up. It's going to be like 15 grand or something. Um, and they would be like, no problem at all. So this feature was great because it meant I could say, say, for example, at one point um, I decided to buy a Rolex so I phoned up and I told them there was going to be a transaction for £12,500. Um, and they were like, that's fine, no problem. Um, we've put a note on, so it should just go through. Mm-hmm. And then, sure enough, the next day when I went back for the watch, it just went through and no bother at all. Was so, that your first big? That wasn't the first big one, no. no. This was later on, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was kind of building up to that, you yeah. know. So the first, I mean, the first time it got kind of a bit more, if you if you mean like kind of luxury sort mm-hmm. of thing, was probably when I started travelling. Um <laughs> Because up until this point, so we're talking about maybe a year or two into this, um, I hadn't really done much travelling or anything like that. It'd all been kind of stuff around about and how Glasgow. old were you? So I'd, pre- I'd say probably about maybe, I must have been about 19 or something. So yeah. still young? Yeah, so maybe mm-hmm. about, I would say either 18 or 19. What you know? kind of feeling did this give you that you were earning money and you were kind of, not singled out, but kind of a loner and was this fueling your fire to kind of I'm making something of my life obviously you're doing it for the wrong reasons but was that filling an emptiness and a void within you I think what happened um, basically because I was able to buy things I was able to go into I mean when I when I was able to start moving in adult circles like going into pubs and meeting people and you know did you feel as if you were fitting in I felt I felt I think maybe for the first time that I was actually having some people that were interested in me if that makes sense you know so and part of the reason for that was obviously because I was able to spend money you know had all this money at my disposal probably using you though oh a hundred percent you know hundred percent there's you know it's it's funny because I I didn't really think of it at the time you know I just thought this is great you know people actually like me and stuff like that and don't be wrong some people genuinely did Mm -hmm. you know despite that they never really knew what was going on and what the what the reality of my situation was there's a couple of people that I still keep in touch with but the majority of them no because you know it's not I I don't know if I wouldn't like to maybe say that they've done anything wrong because we were all young you know but yeah. there was a lot of fair weather friends, you know, just people who were around for the champagne and the, the drinks. And mm-hmm. I mean, I'd like bought um, one point this girl that I hardly even knew. It was a birthday party, and I went and bought her a fifty pound voucher out of USC. Didn't even really know her. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I gave her this card with a fifty pound voucher in it. It was just, I mean, that's crackpot material. You know, yeah. if somebody somebody did that to me, be like, mm-hmm. what do you want? You know, yeah. but but it was just that was that was the kind of thing I did because I was I was very much the impression that money would buy friendship. Mm-hmm. You know, and obviously I realise it buys the wrong kind of friendship, oh, though, doesn't it? Because when the money dries out, yeah. nobody's there to be sitting with you when it eventually does. <laughs> Correct. So you, when you started, when you started travelling, then what were you? Were you kind of escaping, or you just want to get what you could out of it? 
I think it was a bit of both, you know. I just thought this is great, right? Let's ride with us. And I, I mean, I, I just, I mean, obviously falling out with my parents wasn't ideal, you know. But they were, they, they were absolutely fed up, you know. I was mm-hmm. treating them quite disrespectfully, if yeah. I'm totally honest with Did you. you Feels as you if know? you were doing them a favour by fucking off and uh, travelling. Maybe a wee bit, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong, you know. The one, one thing I can say about my family is, that, you know, they've always been very supportive. Um, I fucked up quite a lot. But, As you do, you mate, know, we all do. But, but they were always there for me, you know. Mm. That's not to say they were always waiting with open arms, you know what I mean? But <laughs> but regardless of whatever yeah, happened, yeah. you they're know. They're the ones when you go to court and get the jail. 100%. They're they were still always there. there. Yeah. Absolutely, mate. You know, do you know what I mean? And we can give them a rough ride. And I've, yeah. I've told my story to a certain degree, but I'm going to tell it next year to everything the shit that I've done. And you, you know yourself, it's the only ones that stand there as mm. the ones that are crying in the dock are the ones that are just sicky yeah. what you're doing. You know you're yeah. doing wrong, but... There's fuck all anybody can do because you think there's a stage in your life where you think you know everything. I, I still kind of think that even though I know I knew fuck all back then, but you learn from your mistakes. Like we wouldn't be sitting here now, you wouldn't be telling your story if you never started going, okay, I've fucked up, I've messed up and we've not even scratched yeah. the surface yet, but it can be, you look at your story and you think, fuck me, man, was I that bad? Because <laughs> at that time you probably thought to yourself, it was fine. You weren't hurting anyone. Yep. Do you know what I mean? So... <clears throat> When you started getting your flights, where was the first place you went to? London. Was, was it? the first place I went to, yeah. London was uh, the first time I went away by myself anywhere out of Glasgow. It was London I went to. Um, and I always remember, like, just, uh, you know, I, I got a taxi in London at one point. I don't remember exactly where I was going to. Um, but the, the taxi was like, it was a five minute journey or something, it was like 20 quid. And I was like, ah, oh, it's fine. Mm-hmm. So I gave, I gave the driver 30 quid. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> just, just basically couldn't believe it. I was in London. I went round Bond Street and went to all these shops and stuff. And I mean, even at that point, I was still, I still wasn't really kind of spending massively. It was like, you know, I was looking, but I wasn't really, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I remember at one point I met um, a group of, like, was it two, I, two or three American lassies that were in London studying. And we just got on really well, so I met up with them a couple of nights, and then one one afternoon we went out Bond Street, went into this jeweler's. I can't remember the name of it, but it was like this jeweler was like, you know, I'm talking about huge jewels in the window and stuff like that. Literally, like biggest things I've ever seen in terms of jewelry. And went in and um, <laughs> says to says to the, one of the girls, "Do you want to try it on?" So she's tried on this like mad ruby like necklace, like a choker thing with huge stones in it. Um, and I was like, how much is it? And he was like, that one, sir, is a million pounds. <laughs> I was like, can we get that on American Express? <laughs> no, yeah. I don't think so. No, I mean, there are some cards you'd get that with, don't get me wrong, that you could easily spend that money on. But is there cards that you can get? What's the limits? What's the maximum you can get in a card? So, some cards don't have any limit at all. Um, what I kind mean, of cards? so like you've got, well, there's a few that do this. Um, probably the most, most well known ones, American Express and Turing card. Um, so it's a, it's a black card. Um, and the deal with it is it doesn't have a preset credit limit on it. Obviously, American Express will have some kind of limit on it, but they'll know how much you're worth. And it basically goes up based on your spend. And you've got to be invited for this card. You can't just apply for it. Um, I think from the, from the information I've read about it, I think you have to spend at least $200,000 a year or £200,000 a year on it, um, on a platinum card to then be invited for this. Um, it's so, not that much compared to what circulating in the world now. No. It's not, I mean, it's compared to the money that some people have mm-hmm. got, it's hee-haw, mm-hmm. you know, but... Would there be security checks if you were to swipe for something for a million, I'd imagine? It would depend on, you know, it would depend so on like your J- previous spend. Jay-Z or somebody goes in with... Nah, so you won't have a problem. Do you know what I mean? No, that'll just go through on the nod, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? So, some somebody with that kind of money or status, it'll just go through, you know, because they, they, they it's would... It's fucking crazy that how that can happen. It's bonkers. Mm-hmm. You've got to think, though, I mean, these people are worth billions sometimes, yeah. So these credit card companies will, would not want to do anything that might upset that person, you know. Can you imagine, like, well, just you, the example you've used, Jay-Z goes into a shop to buy, like, a diamond bracelet or something at $2 million, mm-hmm. and his card bounces. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's not going to be happy with American yeah. Express or whatever card company it is. So there's a few cards like that that don't have preset limits, but there will be some kind of limit on it. So when you're in that shop and she's got a million pound necklace, were you thinking... I'm going to get that one day, or were you thinking that's out my reach? No, I, I don't think I thought either of those things. Mm-hmm. I was just, I just thought I was a big man, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. it was like, she was like, oh my God, I can't believe I've just tried on a million dollar necklace or a million pound necklace or whatever, you know? When we came out of the shop, she was absolutely jumping, you know, she was so buzzing about it. 
Um, but so yeah. yeah. So what was your plans then in London? What were you thinking? So I just I don't know, just couldn't have a good time and buy, party mode. buy shit basically. Mm-hmm. You know. <laughs> what was your biggest ever spend? So the biggest thing that I ever bought um, in terms of value would have been a BMW Seven Series. I bought when I lived when I lived in Belfast, but the thing was, I never actually ever picked up the car. Um, basically, I went for a test drive, and one of my my pals was with me at the time, and then um, I couldn't I couldn't drive. I had no clue how to drive a car, so it was so ridiculous. Like so even just thinking back on it, it's so stupid. But we, me and my mate rocked up to the BMW showroom, you know, and I was like, right, just had a look at a few different cars. And obviously, the way I always thought about things back then was, right, what's the most expensive one? <laughs> so it was like this 7 Series. Um, and I think, if I remember right, it was about £50,000 or something. Um, and the guy's like, so the salesman, do you want to take it for a test drive? He's like, sounds great. And then as soon as we went to get in the car, I realised I couldn't drive. I was like, how's, how's this going to work? I says, just you drive it to the salesman. He's like, are you sure? I was like, absolutely, just you drive it. So I was like, I don't have my licence with me. He's like, oh, it's fine, I don't mind. I was like, no, no, just you drive it. So I'd get busted if I tried to drive the car. I don't know what I'd have done. I'd prank the showroom or something, you know what I mean? So anyway, he t- <laughs> took the car for a drive and then obviously we got out of the car. He's like, so what do you think? And I'm standing in front of this guy, one of my mates at the time. He's like, I'll take it. <laughs> How'd you pay for it? Just for a card. I paid a, paid a deposit, so the full amount wasn't paid on a card. Mm-hmm. It was a deposit that was paid, and the rest would have been paid when it was supposed to. Mm-hmm. I think the deposit was about 10% or something. Aye. So, five so you never got it? How did you not pick no. it up? Because I get jailed. Oh, did you get jailed? <laughs> but the thing that? is, even if I hadn't, I don't think I would have been able to pick it up because mm-hmm. no driving license, you know what I mean? So, Where else did you travel in the world? So I've, I've been all over um, America, been to South America. Um, been all over Europe practically. Um, Who was it using cards in America? Was it easier in South America? Aye, so in America at the time it was different. Like literally, some some shops you would go into, the card machine would be at your side of the till, so you would basically swipe the card through, and then you'd sign the receipt. And sometimes they would ask to see the card, but most of the time they didn't bother, because it's quite common in America for for folk to give their card to somebody else, or it certainly was back then. Whereas over here it was kind of. I was frowned upon, you know. Mm-hmm. In America, I'd be like, you know, just take my credit card and go shopping or something like that. So it was different, you know. There was, there's, their system was not anywhere near as advanced as ours in terms of, you know, fraud detection and stuff like that. So it was, in some ways, it was a lot easier. But I was always quite um, thingy about doing anything like that in America because it's something that they take so seriously over there. Um, you know, like even a small, you know, fraud crime, you can get ten years, twenty years. Even if years. it's a British card you're using? Oh, well, of course, because you're still committing it on their on their territory, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so you could go over there with any card from anywhere in the world, but, you know, what you're doing is you're committing fraud on American soil. So um, so I was always very careful, and, and, and what I did when I was over there was just try to use cash for everything, just because I just didn't want to even risk it, you risk. know. Yeah, um, don't fuck about over there, man. No, they definitely don't. You what know? kind of stuff were you buying over there? Oh, no, I didn't really do a lot of spending there, to be honest mm-hmm. with you, just like clothes and... The, the way it was, right, is I would buy clothes. That was the thing that I spent a load of money on was clothes. Just always buying clothes. Like, because I was travelling, like, I didn't really have, like... <laughs> this is so stupid, but... The amount of, like, pairs of Calvin Klein boxer shorts I left in hotel rooms because I had no way to wash anything. I would just go out and buy, you know, new boxers and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, I mean, literally my life at that time was shopping, drinking, sleeping, eating, shopping, drinking, sleeping, eating, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. That was that was what my life consisted of, you know. Was just yeah, going so out, just travelling the world, trying to aye. see the world, eating, drinking, champagne. Was aye. that how much did you spend in nightclubs and stuff? Oh, fortunes, man! Like there was a few times. I mean, so I remember one night I was in Miami and I was only there for three nights, but I stayed at this like really swanky hotel in Miami and arranged for like a limousine to take me out to go to these clubs, um, and it was, <laughs> it was so stupid, right? Because I was thinking I was going to rock up here, like, you know, like looking like some, like the dawn, basically, you know, a stretch limo, tunes blaring, pulled up at this nightclub, and, like, the guys came out and opened the door, like, literally, people just looked and then looked away as if it was just, like, normal sort of thing yeah. happens all the time, you know, mm-hmm. like, it's just to the impressment of absolutely no one. Um, but, no, I mean, it would be quite common for me to go into a bar or nightclub and, like, just order champagne for everyone. Um, I th- 
but I think maybe the biggest bar tab I ever had somewhere was about maybe twenty thousand pound. Yeah. And that was just for bottles of like Dom Perignon and that just for everybody. So that's the kind of shit that I used mm-hmm. to do. And it was, you know, I mean, don't be wrong, it was a nice feeling, but as as you say, looking back on it, you know, at the time everybody's all over you. Like, who is this guy? This guy's amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, but see the thing is, for all these things that I was doing, James, deep inside, I was not a very happy person yeah. at all. You know. How many credit cards did you have in your wallet at one time? Um I think I don't know it's hard to say because it varied you know like basically cards would get used and then they would get stopped and then they would be disposed of you know so I was always I, like I made every missed every time I made a mistake I tried to make sure I never made that mistake again so such as being caught with like two cards and two different names like you know I got arrested or not arrested pulled by the cops in Manchester once and it was a case of I had this card um, and I also had like a paper copy of a driving license that I'd managed to get in this name so they asked about that because what had happened was I went into a, a pub in Manchester and the guy behind the bar recognised me from a previous time using a different card or a different name. So he called the cops and then I left the bar but the cops had followed me and you know I showed them that and I showed them the licence and basically they let me away with it. So, But if I'd had two cards with two different names on, then I would have been screwed. Yeah, you're fine. So, so I always tried to make sure whatever mistakes I made, that I never made them twice. Mm. Like any receipts for anything that was bought, was they were chucked away immediately in the bin straight away. How long did you end up in Canada for? Well, um, so I was in Canada. I've been I've been to Canada three times. So the first time I went passed without incident. Uh, that was the first time I went like proper international, um, first class flight over there and everything. That was great. Um, but that was the first time I was away like proper international. Um, the second time I went, I had a bit of an incident. So. Uh, I went back to my hotel and obviously something had see I always tried to like make sure that whatever was happening with these cards I was keeping up to speed with it so I'd like be phoning and checking to see if it was still active and try to make little inquiries or make a, a purchase at a telephone box like you know it used to be I don't know if you can still do this but you used to be able to put your card into the telephone box to make a call so I would know if it went through if I was able to make a call that the card was still okay so it was just all these little things that you're constantly doing to check but this this um, time in Canada, so I had little like things that I would do. So whenever I was staying at a hotel, um, whenever I returned to the hotel room after being out, I would tap the door and I would just say housekeeping, just to see if there was anyone in the room, because obviously I didn't, you know, I knew that if they were going to try and catch me at a hotel, that's where they'd be waiting. So this one time, I got back to the hotel in Toronto and I was carrying hundreds of bags of shopping. Um, didn't tap the door, just walked in. Boom, busted. In your room? Yeah. I well, I didn't get busted though properly because mm-hmm. I knew they were there. I heard walkie talkies going, so I dropped everything and just ran. So basically, <laughs> ran down the back stairs of the hotel, and I swear to God, it was like something at a film. So I, f- I f- didn't know where I was going. I just kept running, and um, burst through this like a double swing door, and I was into the kitchen. <laughs> It's like chefs preparing stuff all the way, running through the, the, f- the fucking kitchen. Gets to the back door, unfortunately it was open, like, you know, it's like basically where they throw all the bin bags out. I went down, down these wee flight of stairs and there's this wee guy sitting in his car, like just an old guy. So I pulled out my wallet and I just went, Canadian Secret Service. <laughs> no way, you believe it. I swear to God, I jumped in the back of the car. I was like, I told him, I was like, we need to commandeer your vehicle, sir. And he's like, oh my God. And the guy was an ex army, um, like ex Canadian army. So he was like pure happy to help and all that. He was like, mm-hmm. obviously, the highlight of his life, I think. So I, t- <laughs> so I told him to take me to the airport. Um, so we arrived at Toronto Airport pretty much. Um, and he was trying to ask me questions. I was like, I can't tell you, sir. It's top secret. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the guy was totally swallowing it, man. It was, mm-hmm. I couldn't believe it. So we got to the airport and he's like, uh, he's asked me if I want him to take me to the police station at the airport. I was like, no, 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 it's fine. Just take me to the terminal. Booked a flight to Chicago and got the fuck out of there ASAP. Mm-hmm. So you'd think after that I would have learned my lesson um, about maybe not going back to the same place again. How did they know you were looking for you in Canada? How did I know? No, how did they know I don't to know. look for you? I don't know. Was it different never, names? You always keep your passport on you as well? So the only thing, yeah, always always kept my passport on me. Never left that anywhere, mm-hmm. just in case. You never, you never know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the only thing I can think of that, the, the reason why they knew about that was because I used to use like travel websites like Expedia, um, was it Travelocity or something? There was all these different ones that I would use. Um, and I think what happened was that they became aware um, 
and that's the only thing I can think of because uh, I still don't know a definitive answer to how they knew about that but somebody knew something you know mm-hmm. um, so but that time I managed to escape the next time I wasn't so fortunate how did they catch you again why did you go back your third time so I went back to Toronto but I didn't stay at the same hotel it was a completely different hotel and that's where the Expedia thing came in so there was a fraud investigator at Expedia now you've got to bear in mind like a lot of the time I would have a physical credit card but sometimes I didn't have it Um so it would be a case that I would have card numbers, card details. So what I was doing was going on and booking flights, um, you know, through these websites, these travel uh, booking websites. And this guy at Expedia had become aware of what was going on. So I'd tried to con the system a wee bit because I, I reckoned that they would have a thing set on their on their website where basically if, if I tried to make, because all the, all the bookings I made were always in my own name, right? So I reckoned that if I tried to change my name slightly, but I knew that the name couldn't be changed too much because I would have to explain it when I arrived at the hotel that it was just, you know, an error in typing it in sort of thing. So I changed the name slightly, like one letter out of place or something like that, two letters out of place. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and when I got to the hotel, it was all fine. I checked in, no bother at all. And then um, this time I wasn't so lucky because I arrived back at the hotel but they weren't in the room this time. They were like just plain clothes at the reception, and I got pointed out by the reception staff, and that was it. How was that? Busted. You got done. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it wasn't the first time I'd been arrested, but it was more. It was a lot more scary because it was in another country, and I kept saying to myself, "Oh, it's cool. It's Canada. You know, it's like a pure forward-thinking liberal country. Probably absolutely brand new." Obviously, it's never good getting arrested, but you know what I mean? I wasn't too worried. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it had been across the border, uh, I would have been Thailand shitting myself. Somewhere, yeah. Aye, exactly. So, um, aye, but it, it was probably one of the most horrendous experiences of my life, to be honest with you. How like, come? Because uh, it, was, it was mental. I mean, it was, it was a totally different um, thing. Like the prisons over here, I mean, obviously it's a long time since I've been in a prison here, but the way it used to be, I mean, compared to Canada, they were quite... You know, I don't want to say decent because prison's shite. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. where it is; it's still shite. But you know, over there, like you're an orange jumpsuit on, um, you know, like you're in a cage basically. So you're 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 in a cell, which is in turn in a cage, mm-hmm. and basically you get your food, and it's just like papped through a wee a wee hatch, and everybody's got to go and pick up their food, and you sit around this table, um, and there was like people getting shanked and all sorts of shit going on. I mean, I never seen it with my own eyes, but I heard it once or twice. You know, just crazy shit happening mm-hmm. so I think this was when like the wee boy in me came out because I was just like pff, very upset you know how old were you then uh, so Canada I would have been uh, like 20 21 maybe 20 aye, about 21 I think just at that point young boy draft aye yeah. a wee dafty do you know what I mean literally like all these things going on but still deep inside just a wee, a wee dafty you know <laughs> Take some bottle no. to be doing it and travelling. You doing it yourself? Were you taking pals with you? What doing all that? No, yeah. I didn't. I didn't. Didn't take anyone travelling with me. The only time I did that was when I went to. So I booked a. I booked a flight um, for me and one of my mates. So that's a guy I still keep in touch with. Um, I won't mention his name if you don't mind. But it's a guy I still keep in touch with um, from my days in Belfast. You know, decent guy. And um, it was his birthday. You know, so I was like, right, I'm going to book his flights. We'll go to Amsterdam for the weekend. So booked these flights and then. Mind I was saying about having like little checks that I would do to make thing make sure things were okay. So this one time it was uh, an airline, so I phoned up and I said, um, you know, I pretended to be from that airline's desk at the airport and just said, listen, our systems are down just now. Is there any chance you could check this booking for me? So I gave them the the booking reference, and the guy on the other end of the phone was like, nah. He says actually, he says there's a wee problem with that booking. I said, all right. I said, what is it? He says, well, he says there's a, a note on here that says it, it's a potential fraud booking and um, the police have to be contacted. So I was like, oh my God. I said, right, well, the police are not far from here. I'll go over and let them know. And the guy on the phone was like, is, is, is the passenger still there? And I said, yeah, the passenger's still there. I said, he's, he's, he's not too far away. I'm just going to go and let the police know just now. I said, oh, okay, perfect. Thanks very much. So I got off the phone. I was like, right, we're not going to Amsterdam. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so that was fucked. Um, I said to him, like, tell you what, mate, we'll just go to Edinburgh instead. <laughs> he didn't seem too happy about that, you know. But, With that Edinburgh. Ah, well, so, so when you were in Canada, because who did you call and pretend that you were the embassy? Right, so what basically happened was 
at the end of the, the whole procedure, my, my court appearances in Canada, um, I was very fortunate. I got away with that. It was a, either, was it three months? Uh, no, sorry. F- I, get, I got a year, right? But I'd been there for four months. And basically, because the conditions in the jail were horrendous, the judges at court were given like three days to one credit. So for however long you'd spent in remand, it counted as three days of, of your sentence. So ended up being that that my four months meant that I'd been there for like a year. a year. So that was my sentence complete. So it was time served basically. But because I'd been ordered to be deported from Canada, um that had to be arranged as well. So um I, I just wanted to know when I was being deported and I tried phoning up the Canadian um immigration department and I said to them, look, you know, can you tell me when I'm being deported? But they wouldn't tell me anything for security reasons. You can understand, obviously, you know, but so they wouldn't give me the information. Um, so I thought, right, because this was the way my brain worked. I was like, right, I'll find a way, you know. So I phoned up and I just phoned up, I, I phoned up again as, uh, you know, whoever it was from, from the British Embassy. Uh, and I just said to them, look, you know, um, we, you know, we're calling up to see when Mr Castro is being deported. Uh, you know, put on a pure stiff, stiff upper lip British accent, and then the guy couldn't have been more helpful. He was like, "Ah, yeah, Mister Castro, uh, he's going out on Monday." Um, and then, and then he had a look and he said, "Oh, he said we've been asked to contact Detective Ralph Eastgate at Heathrow Airport to let him know." And I was like, "Oh, that's okay." I said, uh, "Don't worry, the embassy will take care of that for you." And the guy was like, "Ah, that's great. That's less work I have to do. Thank you so much." <laughs> I was like, mm. "So at this point, I knew that somebody was potentially going to be waiting for me." I swear to God, that flight. <laughs> shite yourself. Oh my! Seriously, shite myself, mm-hmm. because I knew that there was a chance it might have worked, but then there was also a chance because it's always the unknown unknowns. Yeah. Do you know? What I mean, mm-hmm. you don't know for sure. So. What happened then, on the day I was being deported, they came and picked me up. Um, they took me to like a holding centre at the airport for an hour or two um, and then took me over to get on my flight. So they basically took me through the airport and stuff. And when you're deported from Canada, you get this like, it's like a, an envelope of all your information, your tickets and everything, your passport and everything's put in this envelope and it's got a mad like rubber stamp on it, sort of like a wax seal. Can it? I've never seen anything like it in my life. But this, this gets passed to the purser on the plane and what's supposed to happen is they're supposed to escort you to um, immigration at your destination and pass your, your things over and say, yeah, this person's been uh, deported. But uh, what ended up happening was the purser came over and started speaking to me. He was just like, you know, it's like, what happened? You know, what what, what what happened to you? And I was like, oh, I got involved in a fight, mate, basically. I just had a t- way too much to drink. And the guy obviously felt sorry for me. Do you know what I mean? He's like, you could see a young boy, he's like, could, could have been any of us, you know? Mm-hmm. So when we, when they landed, he came over and he gave him my stuff. He says, here you go. He says, good luck. Wish you all the best. So I was like, <laughs> passport it. That, that envelope, I literally tried to stuff it in my pocket. I didn't want anyone to see it. So I um, went up to the border control, gave him my passport. The guy just looked at me and said, welcome home, sir. <laughs> Walked through, right? But at this point, I still didn't know I was in the clear. Mm-hmm. You know, because this is what the cops do. See, when it's fraud and stuff, like, they want to catch you by stealth, you know? So I was, like, literally just wanted to get the fuck out of that airport as quickly as possible. So, um, got out of Heathrow Airport. I was like, right, okay, I still need to get back to Glasgow. Um, I had no money because the Canadian authorities had confiscated all my cash. Um, no cards, nothing. And then, so I was just sitting, like, somewhere. I can't remember. I went into central London. I was just sitting somewhere. And basically, like, went through all the stuff in that envelope and I found the ticket that the Canadian authorities had booked. And the credit card number was at the bottom. But the expiry date and that, I couldn't believe it. I was like, really? So I didn't, I thought to myself, this might not work. Mm -hmm. But I tried booking a flight from London Gatwick to Glasgow and it went through. I couldn't believe it. It's just, see, when I look back, it's probably the cheekiest thing I've ever done. Yeah. Like literally cheeky, cheeky as fuck. Get wants it or anything. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So when you come back from Canada, you end up back up the road. What happened then? Uh, Did you, were you giving up or were you thinking, I'm just going to keep going? How long were you doing it for at this time? So about four years. It's a long time, man. Yeah, between it. I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, I mean, you've got to remember like in that four years, I spent some time in prison as well. Like mm-hmm. shorter sentences, shorter sentences. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't at liberty that whole time. 
but I just didn't learn my lesson, you know. Yeah. So what did you do after Canada and back to Glasgow? So came back to Glasgow and then got involved in it again. Um, just, yeah, just kept going with it, basically. And it, what what happened was I was staying at a, we used to be a hotel in Glasgow, at Bath Street, called the Art House Hotel. And uh, you might remember that from your partying Party days, James. Days, mate, I've been everywhere, mate. Yeah. Cocktail, cocktails, hotel, that kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was staying there one night and... Uh, Basically, I bumped. I came back. The bar was open till three o'clock in the morning or whatever for residents. So I came back, and in the bar was um, a couple of famous DJs who were there. So I ended up chatting away to them. And then when the bar shut, we all went up to my room and just got room service drinks. So they came up to the room. And there's like Louis Vuitton luggage and all that sitting there. So they, they must have thought I was absolutely minted or something, mm-hmm. you know. Anyway, they ended up getting to know them a wee bit and um, invited over to Belfast. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it, I'll go. So I went to Belfast, it was the first time I'd ever been there and uh, had such a great time um, and ended up getting a flat there. So I rented a flat. Now this was the first time I'd ever been anywhere and actually like rented somewhere to live kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was when I started partying, like going out and just getting full of it and um, had a lot of good times over there. Um, but that's when also when everything really started to fall apart. Um, I don't know if there's maybe some correlation there i don't know drink, possibly possibly you know yeah. like so there might be some i don't know <laughs> guard comes down about getting sloppy 100 percent. but see in all honesty and i've asked myself this question many times james i think by that point i had really decided i'd had enough and the reason was um because i was I actually did meet a few people whilst i was there that i really really did like you know genuinely got on with them didn't matter the fact that what i was doing they didn't know about as people we liked each other you know, we had a good laugh and I just, I, it started to really get to me like big time that I couldn't really ever tell anybody about who or what I was at Impulsive that time. Impulsive liar, aren't you? Absolutely. That's what it comes down That's, to, just uh, lying that, yeah. every, your life's a lie. Everything you're telling people, you've got to think, right, what have I told them before? You know, and it was, I mean, I made, I made it easier because I made stories that I kept, I stuck to for everybody. So it became a lot easier. But when I first started meeting people all over the place, because I mean, I was traveling, I knew people in so many different places because of all the traveling I was doing. Some of them I told, you know, they said, because people genuinely, or sorry, generally, when you've got that kind of lifestyle, they want to know how how are you doing this? Who who are you? You know, that mm-hmm. enables you to have this luxurious lifestyle. Um, so what I was what I was telling people at first was that, that I worked for the Ministry of Defence. So I was giving off this whole fucking James Bond Mr. kind of vibe. <laughs> Yeah. Bonkers, isn't it? So that, that was kind of what I was you know, telling people. Um, and then over time, I realised that actually a better way of dealing with it was just because I was staying in all these different hotels. I told people that I was a hotel consultant, and basically I went and helped businesses, hotels by staying in the hotels and taking notes about the service and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And that just nobody ever asked me any questions. What was after your mum and dad saying when you were in Canada in the jail? <laughs> Did they know you were in the jail? Aye, they knew. Did they know? Yeah, they knew because. Um, Obviously, you know, I had to tell them where I was, you know, despite whatever was going on. I wasn't going to leave my parents thinking, what's going on, you know? In case they never heard from you. Aye. Yeah. Did they tell you to get your shit together or were you just a loose cannon again? Several times. Yeah. Yeah. My my mum was a bit more, um, I'm not going to say accepting of it because... You know that was we were we were brought brought up you know to be respectful and mm-hmm. we didn't steal and things like that you know so by this point obviously because I'd been arrested a few times they knew what was going on but there was very little they could do James yeah. you know I I, I, I I if I was going to stop doing this it had to be my decision of course man it's like anybody you know? that's an addict or whatever yep. nobody can do anything it's down to the individual now you're still your mom's son <laughs> so no matter what you do no matter what yeah. crime you'd have done she'd yeah. still came to visit yeah. you she'd have still been there. So when you were in Belfast then, what was life like when you were starting to get tired, you were drinking, partying, and you were thinking, I've done this for four or five years now, it's starting to get draining. Yeah. Were you saving money at that time or was it just everything going out the door? So but there was a bit of both basically because yeah. what, what I'd started doing when I was over there was something that was totally different. So it was still it was still to do with credit cards, but it was a lot more profitable um, in terms of actual cash because... When I had credit cards, it wasn't always easy or it wasn't always possible to get cash on those cards. So there'd be some times where I'd have cards and I could buy anything, but I didn't have any actual money. So when I was in, in Belfast, I started taking trips down south of the border um, and basically picking up uh, money transfers. 
So a lot of credit card companies have got this facility where if you're overseas and you lose your card, that they will uh, wire money to you, uh, you know, up to up to the value of your credit limit sometimes. So I was just using that and going down to Dublin, which is considered, you know, for the purposes of, of this, a foreign country, um, and picking up cash. And sometimes I would I would come back up to Belfast with you know bags full of money. Mm-hmm. So, but did you able to pick the cash up okay? Did you need ID or was it? No, you didn't need any ID because the way I mean the way it was explained to them was that the, the passport had been lost. I lost all my documents, you know, um, and then they would they would set up a, a test question. So as long as you knew the answer to the question and you had the, the transfer number, then like your password, basically. So you would try to find loopholes and everything just to <coughs> constant every day to try and beat the system. Yeah. Yeah, so when you started getting the cash, then did your eyes just become pound signs again? Because kinda, I it's mean, it's not just bags and jewelry and clothes. It's now it's cash. Yeah, so basically, things changed then, didn't it? Yes, things changed a lot at that point because it was. I mean, as I say, you know, there was a part of me that was just really fed up with it. I didn't want to do it anymore. You know, I'd, I'd bought I I bought a set of decks and I started playing music and having mad parties in my flat. Like, I had a flat right in the middle of the town, so it was perfect after clubbing, whatever, like two or three nights a week. Just everybody would come up to mine, get the tunes on, and it was just great, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but when you start doing that, you can't you can't be on the ball when you're doing that. It's just, it's just impossible, you know? Just staying up all night. Yeah. And then and then you've got to kind of be on the ball for your, your fraud. Did you feel career, untouchable, you know? untouchable at any point? I think. Aye, there was a few times I did. Even though you've been in the jail and yeah. you've done it, you just think, I'll learn for this and not get caught again. Well, because what the, the thing to remember, right, is that I, I got arrested quite a few times, but only for small things. And it wasn't until the very end when somebody put the whole thing together, you know, and, and they realised exactly the extent of it, because he'd been sort of doggedly chasing me for, well, it must have been three or four years anyway. So you were under investigation then? Oh, 100%. Mm-hmm. And that was that was down to the airlines because the airlines had, what they'd, um, so there was like a dude that worked for British Airways at Heathrow um, and he'd seen me passing through Heathrow a number of times and um, probably didn't help, you know, that one time I think my flight had been cancelled and I went up and started shouting at him, just being a, being a prick basically, mm-hmm. you know, but he's obviously seen this really young guy um, travelling first class and going all these different places and I don't know he's, for some reason he's done a bit of digging and found you know that he, he thought something was going on so this guy actually what, what he did one time was I was travelling from um, was it London to Manchester so just a very short flight um, and the, t- the the aircraft pulled away from the, the, the you know the the gate and then halfway to the the runway, the, the, the plane stopped and the pilots came on and said, listen, unfortunately we have to return to the gate because there's some rogue baggage on the plane, we need to get it off sort of thing. And I I knew something was not right because I knew that the, the way it worked, I'd been on that many flights to know that, that what they were basically saying was that the baggage was on the flight but the passenger wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I knew that that didn't happen because if the, unless the passenger was on the flight, the baggage didn't go on, end of story, mm-hmm. for security reasons, right? So I was like, that doesn't make sense. But we went back to the, the gate anyway. And sure enough, two cops came on the plane. Um, and I had like... So I used to cut about with a copy of the Financial Times, James. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I was like that with the, the newspaper. Did you, <laughs> Eyes did, cut out. Did you ever watch uh, what was it, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Mm-hmm. So you know when they're on the, the Zeppelin uh-huh. and uh, Sean Connery's like that with the newspaper because mm-hmm. the Nazis come on, basically. Mm-hmm. So that was me mm-hmm. with the newspaper. And uh, shoot, it didn't matter because they knew my seat number anyway. But I was just hoping that maybe. So anyway, they pulled me off the flight, and um, so we're, we're this little sort of bit next to the, the runway. It was bizarre, um, and the cop. It soon became apparent to me that they actually didn't have any evidence at all. This was just this guy's hunch, because he was saying this cop was saying to me things like, "Oh, imagine what your mum's going to think when she finds out about this," and they kept trying to get me to say that it wasn't my card. I was like, "No, it is my card. It's been booked with." 100% it's my card and then because I realised that they didn't actually have any evidence I was just I just kept sticking to my story and I couldn't believe it when they were like well right okay we'll, we'll just need to let you go then I was like 
I wasn't expecting that at all. Mm. I thought, I'm done here, you know. Yeah, because see, when you're booking flights, obviously your name's on the passport would be different with yeah. the booking. Uh-huh. Could they, did they not have that details then? No, so, I mean, the, the name, when I was booking the flights, the, na- the flights were always booked in my name mm-hmm. because obviously it had to match the passport. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it was slightly different for domestic flights at that time. I think now it's a bit stricter, obviously, but but the, the thing, what they were saying was that the flight had been booked or the ticket had been booked with a, a you know a card and this guy with the guy from British Airways was saying this now just to put you in, in the picture right so this guy from British Airways is standing at the side the whole time mm-hmm. um, and when the police were letting me go I could tell just by looking at his face Smuck. he was absolutely bailing mm-hmm. no he was raging he oh, was yeah. he was because they were letting me go mm-hmm. but they didn't the guy you were arguing with uh-huh. at the start yeah mm-hmm. so he was like one of the senior managers or something like that I don't know I can't remember. I still remember his face um, but he was absolutely raging and uh, so, so what happened but anyway was um, he came up to me like after the you know the police had said right we're going to have to let this guy go, um, and he came up to me and he was like it was so fake he was like oh, I'm so so sorry about what's happened, um, please let us make it up to you. Um, here's a voucher to go and stay at this hotel at the airport for the night, and we'll get you booked on the, f- the first flight tomorrow morning. I'm really sorry for the mistake, but I was obviously I knew he was talking shite. You know he was absolutely raging. Mm-hmm. So anyway. Um, that night, I just that I didn't go to that hotel because I would I knew something was something was rotten about it, you know. Uh, so I went and stayed with a friend in central London. Um, but it turned out after, so I didn't know this until after the very end came and I was arrested for the la- for, for the final time. But it turned out that I was right in that decision because what actually had happened was he'd went back. And then someday at the CID at Heathrow had picked up something or seen something or he'd been in touch or whatever happened. Um, and like four squad cars re- report, um, raced down to the hotel uh, to try and catch me. And obviously when they went into the room, I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was very lucky, a lucky yeah. decision, you know. But you end up getting caught anyway. I so, end up getting yeah. caught anyway, aye, but, no, not, but just not at that exact yeah. moment, you know. Do you, do you always have gut feelings that something ain't right? Quite often, yeah. Uh, I get it a lot when I meet people, mm-hmm. um, and I just know that there's something. something's off. I don't. Energy. I'm not necessarily a bad person, mm-hmm. but I think I think when you meet people, you ha- yeah. like you've got to trust your energy. Mm-hmm. You know, if you meet somebody and you get a bad vibe off them, yeah. I'm not saying that I've never been wrong because I have, but very rarely. Yeah. And if if I ever meet somebody and I get that kind of feeling, I just keep away Step from them. Back. Absolutely. So when did you get done for the big one? <laughs> so that was that was well that kind of follows on from the Edinburgh trip mm-hmm. I was talking about earlier on. So we were supposed to be going to Amsterdam, that didn't happen. So ended up booking a flight from the other airport in Belfast to Edinburgh. So we left um, and booked into a hotel in Edinburgh called the Glass House. Um, and I'd stayed there before. So uh, I'd stayed there once before and that time I'd stayed there was when I went to a jeweler's in George Street in Edinburgh mm-hmm. and bought the, the Rolex. So what I'd done was, um, obviously when I was, I was saying earlier on about receipts, receipts always get binned, you know. So I'd basically bought that that watch that time and went back to the hotel in Edinburgh and chucked the receipt in the bin. Um, so I'll explain why that's relevant later. But So me and my mate checked into this hotel and the following morning we woke up, I went for a shower and I told him, I'm going out for 10, 15 minutes, I'll be back shortly. So I left the hotel, short walk up to Harvey Nichols, went in and bought £2,500 of gift, or was it, sorry, £2,000 of gift vouchers on this uh, American Express card. It was one of the rare occasions where the card wasn't in my name. Right? So anyway, if the customer service room was like, if you get any other ID, a fair question, you know, it's a big purchase. And I was just like, just I was such an arsehole about it. I was like, nah, it's fine. Just, you know, give give Amex a call. They'll verify everything. Don't worry about it. On you go. You know, so she phoned them up and sure enough, obviously I knew all the details. So they approved the transaction. Um, but see what I was saying earlier on about unknown unknowns, mm-hmm. right? So I went back to the hotel, picked up my mate, um, and said, right, let's go and get, get some clothes. So I went back to Harvey Nicks, um, menswear department, and up until this point, every time I went in that shop, I spent at least £2,000. So the menswear manager was always the first one to come out and see me, how are you doing? Get this in, get that in, would you like to have a look at this? And I would literally get around the, the full menswear department and go, right, I'll try this, I'll try this, I'll try this. And have about maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30 items of clothing to try on. So we're halfway around doing this. Um, and I, I said to the manager, I was like, I'm just going to nip to the loo quickly. So I popped into the loo, uh, did my business. And then when I went to open the cubicle door, this guy was standing there. 
and like grabbed my arm. He's like, we need a word with you, mate. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, and this is what I'm saying about getting sloppy, very sloppy as well. I had about three or four different identities in my wallet. So there was absolutely no fucking way I was talking myself out of this one. Mm-hmm. Um, but probably the worst thing that happened that day was obviously getting arrested was shit. But probably the worst thing that happened was, so my mate who'd been with me, um, there had been rumours in Belfast that I'd been up to stuff. And he asked me straight out, you know, he said, is this true? Now, there was no other answer I could have given him. I couldn't have told him. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So I said to him, no, nah, don't be silly, man. Like, you know, I would tell you, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, right, okay, I trust you. So when I've walked out, obviously the cops have apprehended him as well because he was with me. Um, So I came out of the bathroom, I looked over and I just saw his face and he just looked at me and went, you know, and I was like, that hit me right here, man. Like, mm-hmm. That was yeah. hard. Yeah. That was hard. That Is was it? probably the worst thing that happened that day, mm-hmm. if I'm totally honest with you. Yeah, that's the thing that can affect you. It's not just yourself yeah. because you become selfish. Yeah. You think about yourself that nobody else matters, but when you, you start bringing everybody else into it, exactly. the lies and the deceit, yeah. then it becomes a different story. Was that the moment you decided, right, I need to start making changes? So maybe not at that exact moment because yeah, what yeah. I was thinking exactly then was fuck. Um, How but, did I get out of this? <laughs> basically, yeah. So what the reason I was mentioning it? So basically, when they arrested me, I had uh, this Rolex watch on a solid gold Rolex, the one that I bought. Um, it was twelve and a half grand. I think the same watch now is probably about twenty five grand or something. But they took me back to the police station and I, I they said, "Where did you get this?" And I said, "Well, I bought that." And I told, I think, I think what I actually told them was that I bought it at an auction in Boston, Massachusetts. That was the first thing that came into my head. Um, and it might, I might have gotten away with that, except that the staff at the hotel had found a receipt in the bin when they cleaned the room the previous time I was there. And because it was a receipt for a twelve and a half grand watch, kept it. they thought maybe the, the gentleman might need this. So they kept it. So when the police went to the hotel, the staff told them about that and that was it. So I got done for that mm-hmm. uh, and um, various other things so as yeah, well. you don't know if you've already been getting folied, but if they catch you for one thing, they'll be thinking, I've not got enough evidence. So you don't know every time you were in that room, they were going after you, checking your stuff, taking out your receipts, building a case. Yeah. You don't know. Do you know what I mean? That's very possible. I never, you know something, mate, I never even thought about that, but that's very possible. Do you know what I mean? Because what I have, I have asked myself this question, if they kept the receipt for me, why did they not tell me the next time I came to the hotel when I checked in? Oh, you yeah, left this no, here last time. Been, whoever's been uh-huh. putting, keeping tabs on yeah. you, whether it's for three, four years, uh-huh. they've been just going around everywhere, checking every bin, every shop, when yeah. you can get in, yeah. every receipt, just to build evidence, because if you do, you for two grand's worth of shit, you ain't going to get to jail yeah, for that. It's very possible. Do you know yeah, what I mean? But yeah. if you've got a 12 and a half grand receipt, you've done a Rolex, it's enough to build a case. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's I ne- what I'd be I thinking. never thought about it yeah. like that, but I did ask myself the question, you know, why did they not give it to me? That could be the answer. A million percent. For think me, so? A million percent. Uh, you've already been getting tabs on you. You know you have move where uh, they've no had like, yeah, 500 uh, quid or coffees or whatever, uh, meals, uh, champagne. Yeah. We should chat more often. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, so it's, um, that's, for me you'd have probably been getting surveillanced at yeah. that time especially if you were doing big hits so was that when you what sentence did you get two years I got yeah I got two years yeah, much did so, they do you for so I was done for about 80 grand mm-hmm. I think was the total on the, the charge sheet because I get transferred um, so basically the police fucked something up when I got arrested there that time um, so they had to let me go um, I, got, I went I went to Sockton prison in Edinburgh for two weeks and my lawyer done something they've made some some mistake or whatever so they had to let me go um and i was just like i couldn't believe it i was like i can't believe i'm actually getting away with this again because obviously the minute they let me go i'm off ski you know but it wasn't to be um because i had an outstanding probation order in manchester so there was two cops waiting to take me away when i was released for Sockton. so i got taken down to manchester um long story short get pulled up magistrate's court i was given a a lawyer like a duty lawyer who was shite so I asked if I could speak to the court um, and they said well we're not normally supposed to do that but anyway I gave them a spiel about I'm so sorry I didn't comply with the order like I've totally changed my life now blah 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 and like they were like they went away and done their, their wee deliberations and when they came back uh, the magistrates were like yeah so um, we've listened to what you've said and obviously um, said some something pr- prophetic like um, you know the, the sun is shining on you today or something like that and you know we're going to give you a £50 fine so I was like I just couldn't believe it I was like yes so I went downstairs to get my stuff 
and there was another two cops there this time waiting to take me to London and I knew that was it as soon as he mentioned London because I wasn't cops from London weren't chasing me for anything else it was only this guy at Heathrow so sure enough um, got taken down to London Heathrow and that was where I got done um, Heathrow, Heathrow CID how long did you, so was it in so, London you done your sentence so I got yeah so I got two years and uh, the first so I was in on remand for about four or five months I think something like that no was it about three months, roughly, I was on remand, and then when I got sentenced, um, I got sent to an open prison, which was fine. Not too bad. It's fraud. It's no murder aye, or drug, so you're not yeah. your categories yeah. higher, but category C or category. Uh, I think I, get, I was initially category B, which everyone is when they first yeah, go in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was I was put as a category D, so mm-hmm. uh, because of the you know the, the crimes I'd committed was just mm-hmm. like no real danger to the public sort of thing. Yeah. So just a danger to yourself. I pretty much, <laughs> man. You know, no, I mean like you know. But jail? Did you go to in London? So the first jail I went to was Burnwood Scrubs. That's tough. Uh, it wasn't that bad, actually. Like I, I know it's, it's got a terrible reputation mm-hmm. in that, but actually, when I was there, it wasn't too bad. You know, I was jail shite, mate. You know, yeah, as right. I say, mm-hmm. you know, it's funny you hear people. I'm sure you've probably had people in your show before saying, you know, oh, it's a doddle and stuff like that. Well, I don't know if they have, but you do. Nah, the, the, you, the, anybody that says that, they're full of shite. Exactly. That's what, full of shite. but you know, you have heard people yeah. say that in the past. Of course, you know? but that's when I know but, they've been broken aye, by it. Exactly. That's <laughs> so, what I mean. But uh, no, it's it's not a nice experience, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's shite. So, what were you thinking when the, the door gets shut and your cell gets shut and you're thinking, was that when it all hurt you? That so not at that. No, I wouldn't say it was even then. I mean, because as I say, I'd been in prison before. Mm-hmm. But the thing that was different this time, um, you know, I'd like to think part of it was maybe because I was a wee bit older. Um, and I think there's see, I think in men particularly, there's a big change in us between the ages of eighteen and twenty one. You know, it's only three years, but I think we change a lot in those three years. And this time, so I was I was twenty one, I think twenty one and a half or something the last time um, when it, when I got um, put in in jail. And what what basically happened that time was two things. Number one was I saw people coming in and out of prison two or three times that were just you know in their sixties and seventies and stuff like that. And I was just like, I don't want that to be me. You know, I, I think I'd finally realised that this was it was only going to get worse. Because I could keep doing it, but every time I got jailed, it would just be for longer and longer and longer, mm. you know. Um, so there was that side of me. Um, but I also had some amazingly good fortune, um, which was there had been obviously newspaper reports about me. And I got a, I got a letter from a guy called Neil Forsyth, who was an, you know, an, an author and a writer. I think he was writing for FHM at the time, the, the Lads Mag, you know. And he was basically interested in writing a piece for them. So... I said, okay, this was when I was in open prison. Um, so he came and took me out for the day. Now, I didn't realise this at the time. I got into a lot of shit for that because that was actually against the rules. You weren't supposed to go out and do media pieces while you were in prison, you know. Mm. But I didn't realise. So anyway, we did it. And uh, afterwards, he wrote to me again and said, listen, it's a great story. You know, um, I think there's potentially a book there. Would you be interested? So I just thought, you know what? What the fuck else have I got going on in my life right now? Nothing. So I agreed to do it, and it's probably one of the best decisions I ever made, um, because it gave me something to focus on. And the other thing as well, which I realised when, when before I made my decision, I'd already said to myself, "Well, if I do this, I can't ever go back to it, because you know everyone would know, like I, you know, I wouldn't have that anonymity anymore." That was my thoughts anyway. I thought you know. I'd be well known and stuff and for a, for a certain time when the book came out I was so you've got your book I didn't even know yeah, you had the book did you not know no, no. what's so, it called so the book's called Other People's Money okay um, where can people get this book we'll plug it it's on Amazon okay. um, yeah it's on Amazon and uh, as I say it's a guy called Neil Forsyth that, that wrote the book and since then he's been on to do uh, a few other bits and pieces for like the BBC and stuff he's wrote a few TV programmes and stuff as well so he's he's. I think it certainly helped him launch his career as well so there's a few good, thing came, yeah. few good things came out of it how was it then laying yourself bare on in a book for being a liar for years so how hard was that um at the time it wasn't that hard Mm -hmm. because at the time i was just partying loads you know i mean i was doing the book i mean honest to god man i did a radio interview one day and i was absolutely at my face um i was i had this call i was was booked in i was going to do this live interview i think it was an irish radio station um and i'd been up all night partying um, and the call came through as I was in the middle of walking from one party to another. I was walking through um, a park, basically, and the call came through. And I'm absolutely bottle of buckfast in my bag, sat down to take this call, and I don't know how I got through it. 
I listened to it afterwards and I was like, you would never have known. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was fucked, you know, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. So, I so there was a, a lot of good things came out of it as well. Um, but, yeah. What's it estimated you've done all the few years that you've done over three million? So, basically, right, the th- I was only ever charged with 80, 80 grand, mm-hmm. right? But, there was at one point it was mentioned that they thought it, the police reckoned it might be somewhere in the region of two and two and a half million pound. Um, I don't know how they've got that figure, right? And I've thought about it many, many times because obviously I wasn't keeping track. I wasn't keeping track or keeping record for obvious reasons. But I reckon it's. I think it could be somewhere in that because you know I was I was staying in hotels that were maybe four or five grand a night. You know that was a regular occurrence. If I was in London, I was staying at maybe like the Ritz or the Dorchester. Sometimes the rooms were twenty grand a night. What's the difference for twenty grand? <laughs> and a quid room is there much difference? It's not, not, not enough. Mm-hmm. No, definitely not. And you know the thing is, like since then, I've had a look at. Obviously, one thing that I've developed in doing all that stuff was, you know, I know proper luxury from pretend luxury. Um. And you, there isn't, I mean, the only thing that's really the difference in those kind of rooms is the size of the room. You know, some of them, they'll provide you with like a 24-hour butler and that butler's just there for you that whole time you're in the hotel. How much can you eat in 24 hours? Nah, you know it's, what I mean? it's, to be honest with you, mate, if you if, see if you've got billions, right? Fair enough. But, just to show off on it, who's aye, the big man I would the say hotel? so. Nobody needs that, you know? Mm. Nobody needs, I still like nice things, you know? But the difference now is that I work my arse off for them, you know? So... Yeah. It's it and it's and mm-hmm. whatever I buy in my life now is is mine, mm-hmm. you know. So when you go to the jail, done your book, how did family not treat you then? Look, did they know you'd changed, turned the corner, or were you still this like not thinking? Were you thinking to yourself, have I changed, or was it? I was always potentially going back the way. Uh, there was a few times it nearly happened. Yep, be totally honest with you. There was a few times. Uh, since I came out of jail when I've been on Mars and I've went to make that move. Like, not recently, you know, honestly, the last time was probably about 15 years ago. But there was a few times when I, I did actually go and, you know, I was ready for making that move to go and do something. But um, the thing is, now I've got too much to lose, you know. Like, I'm a lot more at peace with myself and there's too much good things going on in my life. I've got a lot to be grateful for. Mm-hmm. Whereas back then, the difference was that I didn't really have anything to lose. Yeah, you're selfish. Yeah. You don't care who you hurt, you don't care what you do. No. You just want to feed your own pockets. At that at that time, at that time, absolutely. You know, that's the way I felt. Whereas now, it's very much not, not about that at all. Because yeah. I know that the damage and hurt that it would cause, not only to myself, but to my family. Do you know what I mean? Because, like, see the thing is, James, I, I put my family through hell, mate. You know, like, I can imagine my mum and my dad worrying sick about me because I was only a young boy you know and I was in a jail full of fucking rapists and murderers mm-hmm. you know I can totally imagine that and and you know the police going around my house and searching my house raiding my house and questioning my, my brother and stuff like that you know it's just it, and, and because maybe I didn't see it first hand I didn't realise just how much hassle and pain I was causing them whereas now the thought of even I just I just wouldn't no. yeah but at least you're identifying with it now at least you're trying to make amends at least you're trying to help people yeah. instead of a lot of people stay in that life but you know yourself when you just get out of the jail and if you're on your ass you think it's easy just to go back to the yeah. even though it can be an easy buck it's hard as well because the other shit that comes with it, it ain't yeah. fucking easy life ain't easy no matter no. if you're doing good no. or bad no. it's painful but if you're doing the right things, you attract better things into your Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And when you started making your transition, started making changes, what did you start doing with your life that was a bit more positive? Did it take a few years or did it happen it instantly? Me, uh, it took me a long a long time to be at peace with myself about it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, people often say, oh, what about the people that you've hurt? Now, see, at the time, I wasn't really thinking about anything like that because my, my view at the time was... It doesn't matter what I do because these cards, the people are not going to pay for it anyway. The banks will just pay it and that'll be it. You know, because if, if you do, I thought my, my view was that because people people weren't responsible if it was somebody else that had used their card, so they wouldn't have to pay anything. But that's only part of the picture, really. You know, there was one time I'd bought a, a flight for one of my 
my pals that I knew when I lived in Dublin for a short time, um, his mum was travelling over to Birmingham for something, some engagement or whatever, and I bought her ticket because they didn't have a credit card, so he asked me, was there any chance you could buy the ticket? Now, I was, I was reluctant, but I couldn't find a good enough reason to say no, so I had to do it. And the problem was that the flight was booked a month in advance, which was far too much time. Like normally when I booked flights, they were booked straight away and there was flights for either that day or the next day at the latest. Um, and then what happened was this guy's mum has turned up at the airport and got huckled at the airport in Dublin because obviously it's came through. Now that makes me feel sick because I'm like, fuck that, you know, if somebody done that to my mum, I'd want to kill them. But, you know, like I didn't mean it. It wasn't deliberate. I definitely didn't want that to happen. Um, but that's, so there's a few, you know, that's probably one of the worst things, really. But there's a few bits and pieces where I've, you know, caused harm to somebody else. And it hasn't been something I've, I've set out to do, but it's just come inadvertently as a result of me being a wee arsehole. You know, that's, that's, and that's what's happened. Yeah. So things like that, you know, but I, so it took me, it took me a while to get over it and like to actually just be at peace with myself because I think I spent a long time, um, and I think you might, you might probably identify with this, but spent a long time thinking that I didn't really deserve to have any good things happen in my life because of all the shit that I'd done. Of course. You know, and yeah. that, that really did to take me, I, I, would, I would say maybe only within the last five years mm-hmm. or so have I'm I actually... still working on that. Like yeah, I've, I've oh, been, I'm still working on it. But I've been on better, a good path you know? for the last six years and kept my hands clean and tried to work hard. And But you still think about yeah. the past. Now, yeah. like I said at the start, I'm going to tell my story next year and get mm-hmm. into more in depth for yeah. the shit that I've done and shit that I'm not mm-hmm. proud of. Mm-hmm. But... I am human. I do yeah. make mistakes. I don't portray myself as no fucking saint. I still mm-hmm. make mistakes to this day. I just know the decisions that I make are my decisions now. I can't mm-hmm. blame anybody. Yeah. I was very good at blaming everybody. Oh, everybody it, else's fault. Yeah. But when you cr- come from a deprived area, you just, it's survival mode. When you st- mm-hmm. If you start making money, then it's a wee bit, I'm doing something with my life. Yeah. But if you ain't making it legit, you ain't doing fuck no, all. You're just it. digging yourself a deeper hole. Exactly. And it can be difficult. And I can understand. That's why when I speak, no matter who I speak to, I can understand mm. where everybody's coming from. I, you you mentioned something, you know, before we started recording earlier, we were just having a chat and you said something about self-sabotage. You know, that was something that I used to do all the time. You know, it'd be like things would things would be going well for me in a, in a certain aspect, something I was doing in my life. And then I would do something that would totally fuck it up. Like, aye, nothing illegal or that, yeah, you know, yeah, just yeah. just like kind of something that, that just stopped that progress from going on any further. Um, and it's only been literally within the last maybe four or five years where I've, I've managed to curtail that kind of behaviour and stop myself from making those decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I've a discussion with friends of mine and they've said, well, you know, maybe it's just because, or maybe it was just because the fact that you, you just weren't, you know, happy with yourself and you were still feeling as though you didn't deserve anything You're still try to figure yourself out oh I, you know I, mean? I don't think that ever ends yeah, see if nah, i'm totally honest never. with you i don't think it because nah. i speak to older people sometimes mm. you know like i know i don't mean older people that have had the same experience as me just older people in general and you know quite often they'll say well that you know that never stops you're always on a voyage of discovery yeah you know um but i like to think that the voyage i'm on now is you know a lot more smooth more smooth, smooth smoother sailing yeah. you know what do you think back looking at that part of your life does it tired <laughs> you out? You just think, how could I have done that? Yeah, I know, right. So when I look, I mean, truthfully, see when I look back at that, I'm like, it's a totally different person. Literally a completely different person. Because the way I thought back then, don't be wrong, I still remember how I was thinking back then. And it was, it was crazy. You know, like literally some of the stuff I would do and it would be, it, there's no fucking way I would do those things now. Not even so much just stuff to do with fraud. I mean, just in general, some of the ballsy shit that I did. Mm-hmm. And there's just no way I would do it now. But, but again, part of that's down to I've got too much to lose now. But, you know, there's a lot to be said for growing up and getting older mm-hmm. and looking at things differently, yeah. you know. Because did you not get done for fraud or did you not buy something and somebody rattled your card? Uh, so I had, had a, a payment or something. A payment came out. Uh, it was a furniture company. How was that feeling? <laughs> it was. I had to laugh, mate. Really. I, I mean, it, it, I got the money back, you know, but I, I still had to laugh because I was like, "That's ironic. Like the the ultimate irony, you know, for that to happen to me." But uh, it was funny, you know. But it's goes to show what everybody else goes through as well. Absolutely, man, yeah, I mean? yeah. People up yeah, I did. I mean, I know people People have had, there will be times when I've done, or there, there will have been times when I've done stuff where people have looked up their, their statement, they've not known anything about it, and they've gotten a statement in, and massively had serious mm-hmm. worries, you know. Yeah, because you don't have an American Express, and you're 
rattling 25 grand a pop and the company was paying it. Yeah, so there was a time I had a corporate American Express mm-hmm. card and uh, basically I, I must have spent, I think it was about, as you say, roughly about 25 grand. Um, but the, the company was just paying it every month. Like, I don't know why, if maybe it was a, the owner's card or something like that. And it was basically just the accountant that was dealing with it. I don't know what happened, mm-hmm. but three months in a row it got paid. And I was like, this is amazing. Uh, <laughs> you know, because I was just like, this is brilliant. How did how do you feel speaking about it and stuff? About what I did? Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's quite cathartic, mm-hmm. you know. It's it's bizarre because when that, when that Vice video came out... Um, I got a lot of messages off people. I mean, literally some of the messages I've got have been people asking for advice on how to do it. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just, I know. Was it me by the way? <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I keep saying to them, like, this, like literally like, last night, I, just, I try and respond to everyone because I think mm. it's the right thing to do. But some of the messages come through and I'm like, I'm not answering that. You know, it's just like crazy things. Yeah. But um, there was one came through last night. It was a guy, and he was like, he was he was getting like pissed off at me because I hadn't responded to him. He was asking me how to commit fraud, and I just didn't reply. And then I was like, mate, are you seriously expecting me to tell you how to commit fraud? I says, you know, that's I can't help you with that. I says, well, you, what you shouldn't even be asking me that. Yeah. Um, and he was like, oh, I'm really sorry, but I've had a lot of like, was one guy from was it fucking Jordan or something like that was messaging me saying, you know, I need some help. I've got like somebody's going to kill me if I don't get three grand within a week, and I'm like. It's a bit heavier or somebody. Uh-huh. It's, it's weird the way, but how do you think fraud now to these days, if you were to be active to 15 years ago, is it total night and days or still loopholes? It could still be done. Yeah. Oh, 100%. If not easier because all the online shopping and stuff. Um, there's different... So it's changed a lot, but it can still be done. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so a lot, a lot, of, like a lot of the work that I've done since basically when the book came out, I started getting phone calls and messages and emails from banks, airlines, um, various different types of companies that wanted to utilise my knowledge, you know. Um, and actually, this is one of the good things that happened, you know, where I started to actually realise that maybe things were getting better for me. And that was when companies were asking me to come and give advice to them, and, you know, take part in, in conferences and, um, you know, like workshops and show yeah. their staff how to, how to spot fraud and things like that. So there was a lot of that happened. So I'm, I'm quite up to speed with the difference in what's mm-hmm. going on now between back then. Um, but it's a lot, obviously there's a lot more digital security now and things like that, which wasn't around then. Yeah. So, but to answer your question, I mean, it could it could still easily be done because the, the, the weak point in the whole process is, is the human being, you know. It's because, you know, if we're convinced of something, so let's say I phoned you, right, and I knew just enough information about you for you to believe that I was calling from your bank, then given maybe five minutes with you, then I would probably be able to extract more information from you that could help me to then go away and, yeah. and commit a fraud. Human beings are vulnerable. They're so easily well, led we and are. manipulated. Yeah, we are. We are I mean? vulnerable. Yeah. But the thing is as well, though, like that, you know... And they're so trustworthy, even though people say they don't trust anybody. <laughs> Tr- everybody's got a wee bit of trust like yep. I say I don't trust anybody but I must mm-hmm. even for you to be sitting here <laughs> other people when you're crossing a road mm-hmm. you're trusting the drivers absolutely so you must yep. You've got, yep. everybody's got some sort of trust in them so yeah I mean that's that, this is the thing though it's, it's you know we are because you can right, so for example right, let's say that you've got your internet banking you've got all your passwords you know that you know it'll go and it'll maybe ask you for three digits from that one and then the member will answer to such and such a question like if you know what you're going to be asked, then all you need to do is find out enough about that person for you to be able to answer that question. It's not always going to work. And it is, it's, I would say it's 100%. It's going to be harder to do it today, mm-hmm. but it's not impossible. But a lot of the phone lines are for like India and Asia and stuff. Is it not easy? To, because they seem to not really have as much information. They yeah. have the information, but the accents and voices uh-huh. are different yeah. as well. So I'd imagine it would be easier to... to managed to be able to fraud have fraud with yeah. all these different offshores uh-huh. and different uh-huh. instead of not so, the British country do you know what actually <laughs> I need to show you this mm-hmm. um, I get a te- I just completely forgot about this until just now so I get a, I get a text message last night um, is that show it to the camera yeah yeah show it to that one right so Halifax UK alert, mm-hmm. right? A new PE attempt was made to a Mr. M. Camille. If this was not done by you, please cancel this PE attempt via, and there's a link to mm-hmm. click there, right? So if, any, if anybody's looking at this, don't click that link, mm-hmm. right? But 
I, I don't even bank with Halifax, yeah. right? But you can see people going and thinking, fuck. If some- the males are the worst, you've got a, a grander Nigeria, or uh-huh. I've had one for iTunes, but I nearly fell for. It was iTunes, and I got a hang me and said it was an, a payment late or something, like 4 99 <laughs> And I went in, but then as soon as you start asking for certain details, you go, right, wait yeah. a minute. Do you know what I mean? But there's people out yeah. there, there's maybe on a, in a Russia, maybe thinking, oh, no, I don't want bad credit and they pay it for you not or their details are gone for you not their accounts rattled yeah. the thing I see if, if nobody was actually do it like, like if no one was responding to these things they wouldn't do it mm-hmm. so pe- there will be people who yeah. are I'm not going to say dumb because that's not fair but they are right? because I've seen a, I seen a programme <laughs> I'm trying to be polite no, here but you mean, I've seen a programme by a woman who was speaking to a man for six months and she gave him over a hundred grand <laughs> and they'd never met he kept saying uh-huh. that they were in hospital his kid was in hospital but I need money or else he's going to die I need 30 grand and she he felt sorry from sent that and then he, he says he needs more op- she needs more operations sent more money yeah. it was, it was not on the telly just last yeah. year and I'm thinking fucking gullible <laughs> cunt do you know what I actually think well do you know what if you're dumb enough to do that uh-huh. then but you, you can feel sorry but I'm thinking yeah. Yeah. come on man she never even it was only phone calls and text messages she's never ever seen the man and then speaking for six months and he ended up running stuff for over a hundred bags mm. Do you know what I mean? So you think, come yeah. on, man. But that's, I mean, that is really obviously playing in someone's loneliness then, mm-hmm. isn't it? You know, yeah. at that point, which I think mm-hmm. is really quite... It's sad. It's very yeah. sad. But I, I get, I mean, I get where you're coming from as well, though. You've got to get, you know, there's a bit of that you've got to say. Yeah. Well, Have a bit of common sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it was one, one of my friends always says, you know, the thing with common sense is, it ain't that common, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. Because it's the banks and stuff as well, you think you're fucking the banks but you're not. That everything that's around it, is, you're destroying as well. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, um... So when you started making the changes, when did you start getting into a mere pot? We'll touch on that. How what was it like working for the screws to eventually them chasing you to then you help yeah. them? We try to balance it out with all the accounts you fucked to then potentially saving hundreds of accounts then by yeah. showing so, them the things that right, potentially so could happen. With basically, fraud. Right, I don't. I've got to be honest with you, James. Right, I don't really feel particularly bad for the banks, mate. Mm-hmm. Right. Now I'm not saying that makes it right for me to have done what I did, mm-hmm. um, because it's not right. You know, but I don't like I, I don't really feel sorry for any financial loss that they've suffered. But there's a part of me that does want to I don't know and in, deep inside I feel that I've got to try and make up for it somehow. Just make it right with the universe kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know. So when I started getting asked to go and do these things, um and obviously don't get me wrong, they were paying for paying me to go and do it as well. It wasn't all freebies, you know. Um and I would go down to like most often down to London and it would be like a, either speaking at a conference or uh, I did a lot of private work for banks as well. Um, so basically they, they would, the, the understanding was that, you know, the work we did was top secret, confidential for obvious reasons, you know, but um, all that stuff that I've done really has, I suppose it's helped me to feel a wee bit better about it, you know, but there's a part of me that also says to myself, well, do you know what, like, I, I did all this stuff when I was a, practically when I was a teenager. Kid. Do you know what I mean? Now, I'm not saying that makes it right, but mm-hmm. fuck me, man. Like, you know, am I supposed to go the whole the rest of my life feeling like guilty about what I did when I was a teenager? It's not going to happen, mate. You know, I'm not the same person anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, as I say, I did I did some shitty things, but my my intention was never to hurt anybody else. That wasn't like that wasn't part of the deal for me. You know. So when I found out about things like that guy's mum going to the airport and stuff, that that really cut me inside because. As I say, I, my, 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 my intentions were never to hurt other people, uh-huh. as obviously it happened, but it wasn't something that I, I meant to do, you yeah. know. So, yeah, doing doing that work, has been, it's been interesting. I mean, don't be wrong, you know, there's times when you, if it's, if it's a conference, you get up on the stage and you think, the people, you know, you know you're being heavy judged, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. literally. Yeah, exactly, yeah. you know, but like I've kind of gotten over that now, you know, mm. and I think I present myself with a bit more, Presentable. Uh, you know, but yeah, because so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite well respected in that mm. scene now as, a, as an authority on fraud, you know, so, um, and I think, you know, anyone with, I would like to say, or like to hope that anyone with half a brain can see you're not that person anymore, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You always get some smart arse so make a comment like one guy I went over to France one time and it was the you know when they go to, when you go to these conferences quite often there's like ah I'm not a master of ceremonies but the person that's kind of you know the chairman of the, the conference sort of thing that's up introducing all the guests and stuff and this arsehole was like oh yeah guys put your wallets away because we've got this <laughs> and I was just like what a dick uh, man uh-huh. um, you know but Are you cheap shot it was just shite mate where was the easiest place in the world to, to fuck over <coughs> Um. Probably the UK. 
Really? Aye. Got a poor bastard. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, most of what I was doing was done here in the UK. I mean, don't be wrong, I travelled a lot, but in terms of actually getting people's information and details and things, most of that was done here. Mm -hmm. Very little of that was done overseas. Yeah. Um, what I would do is, you know, do a bit of work here. And, you know, I mean, sometimes you'd be on the phone for, I don't know, maybe eight hours, just phoning different hotels and try to speak to people and get their details of them, mm -hmm. you know, but just always sitting ready with a notepad. And I would say that about, you know, about maybe 80% of the time I got through to somebody. Do you ever miss that life? Sometimes, but not, like, it's. I've got to be... I've I know got what to, you're saying. I've got to expand on that, cause, right? But I'm talking about yeah, the travelling, yeah, yeah. the hotels, the birds, the champagne. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's a, It's not living like a king, but you know no. what I mean? And with, with, uh, yeah. The external stuff is, but yeah. if you were to take away, you weren't hurting anybody, of course yeah. you would miss that. You would think, I well, think fuck it. Aye, but I think the thing is as well, if I'm totally honest with you, sometimes, for me, I feel as though what's important to me has changed. Do you know what I mean? Like, it used to be like, it was all about material things. And don't get me wrong, mate, I like nice stuff, you know, I probably always will. Um, but it's not, like, I think the things that make me happy in life now are not as much of that as what it would have been before. I think the things that are more important to me now, like spending time with my family and my friends and having good experiences as opposed to going out and spunking 10 grand in clays. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not, it's it's just not the same thing, but... Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I would be lying if I said that there wasn't a part of me that misses those experiences. If I could take away all the shite things that happened and separate the two, mm -hmm. then obviously I would do it again. But it's not, you yeah. know. So what are you doing with your life then now? So, well, I work in sales now, so I don't know how that oh, happens. Bank sales, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> no, no. I work in sales. I've got my own wee business. Mm -hmm. um, so I provide like, a sales consultancy. Right. And that's 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 my my day to day job. Right. Um, so quite boring to be honest with you, but I do enjoy it. It's good and the money's decent. You know, mm -hmm. if you get the sales, the money's good, sort of thing. So that's my main job. Um, and I work. I've got like um, a wee music studio not too far from here, um, which I go. Uh, you know, pay a monthly rent in that place, and I go in and sit and write music and stuff. So up until um, the whole lockdown thing happened, I was you know DJing quite regularly. Um, but it was just more really trying to get into making my own music and stuff. So mm. that's something I've been doing for about seven or eight years now, and I feel finally that the music's getting somewhere where it's it's no bad, you know. Yeah. So that's how I've got that place. Um, and over the lockdown, I spent quite a lot of time in there just trying to hone my skills. Yeah. And so that was like a hobby. It's kind of turning into a yeah. profession now. Well, when I when I came out of the jail, um, I had some good fortune. There's a lot of you know looking back. Do you ever find that sometimes you don't realise how? one experience or one thing that's happened will shape the rest of your days of course, sort of thing yeah, you know yeah. you don't realise it at the I've time it, I've done in the past to shape me to be doing what I'm doing now yeah so if I never done all that shit I wouldn't be sitting here well neither would I do you know, exactly do you know <laughs> so, what I mean so aye. there's always positives yeah, to take yeah. out the bad shit and there's always positives to take out the good shit I think sometimes what, what's, what I've noticed in my life you know and I'm sure you're probably the same I would say probably most people are the same is that a lot of the time these things happen and you don't realise them for what they are at the time mm -hmm. It's not until you look back later and you say, right, you know what, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have met this person or I wouldn't have had that job or I wouldn't have, you know, whatever it is. But when I came out of jail, if, you know, the, the book got written. Um, one of my dad's friends introduced me to some guys who were DJing at a, an open decks night in the town in Glasgow. So I got in about that, got involved with that. Um, many, many parties, many DJ nights. I had a fucking great time doing that. Just really, I've always loved music, you know. Like one of the things whenever I was travelling, uh, whatever hotel I stayed at, when I booked made the reservation, I always asked them to make sure there was a CD player in the room. And I had this CD wallet that I always, it, it went everywhere with me. Um, and my mum has told me that she chucked it out recently. Mm. I was absolutely Devastated. fucking raging with mm -hmm. her. I was like, Mum, she mm -hmm. didn't know. Yeah. But anyway, so that was that was always with me. So I've always had a love of music, and that was how when you know when I came back to Glasgow and the whole DJ thing happened. It just, I think, if I hadn't found that to put my energies into, I think there was the, the chances of me going back to what I did previously yeah. would have been a lot higher. So that know? was like a getaway, your oh, music, 100%. just to yeah. keep you busy and keep yeah. you in a straight and narrow. And not, not only that, I met some really cool people, you know, and the thing was, because I no longer had this persona to keep up, you know, I, I, I started to make real lasting friendships with people, which had been something that... I hadn't, I'd never really had that in my life, ever, you know. Struggle to keep a serious Aye, relationship, yeah. friendship. Absolutely. I mean, my best mate um, and uh, his wife, you know, like, so I've, I met him in 2005 when I was DJing at a night. Um, him and mother, two, well, two, my two best mates, so they were pals first and then I met the two of them and we all became pals, you know. But I'm still really good friends with them. They're great mm -hmm. boys, you know. Um, and, you know, 
I reckon we'll probably be friends forever, you know. Yeah. But but it's just like that's that's the thing that changed was because I was no longer having to pretend to be something I wasn't. It's tiring. Oh, it's mm-hmm. it is, mate. It's a very paranoid yeah. lifestyle as tiring. well, you know. Yeah. You're always trying to remember and keep up with your, with your own lies yeah. that you've told and what, what did you tell mm-hmm. that person and all that mm-hmm. kind of shit, you know. Because I done, I was a gambler. That was my main addic- mm-hmm. addiction. I've had a few addictions, but gambling's one. Then you think about the things you've done to get money to feed your addiction, to feed mm-hmm. your habit, and the lies you do to cover everything up, and you're just tired. That's where you get angry. I was angry all the time because yeah. I knew. Deep inside, you know what you're doing is wrong. Yeah. Even when you're yeah. doing what you're doing, you know it's wrong. You but do. You do you just know it's become wrong, yeah. very selfish, egotistic that you think it's okay. You uh-huh. create it in your mind that what yeah. you're doing is fine. When you tell yourself yeah. all these little stories yeah. to make it right mm-hmm. to you. you so know? how far do you think you'll go with the DJing then? Is it a passion to maybe travel the world with that and take I, it in I your mean, heights? That would, that would obviously be the, the dream mm-hmm. goal to make that it's happen. fucking great business if you can get Aye, the ball rolling if, with if it. If you can do it, you know. I mean, I'm, 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 you know, we were talking about your podcast and how mm. far that's came and stuff like that, you know. And I've got to say, like, in terms of like what my equivalent of that would be, it would have to be the music, because it's the one thing that I know I can do, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm pure amazing just yet, but, but you I'm, should, man. I'm, I'm getting there, so, you yeah, know. man. You got to believe it. Well, I, I believe I can be there. Yeah. is what I'm saying to you. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I'm not. I know I'm not there yet, but I also know there's a journey you have to go through yeah, to get there. Take steps, man. Take so small steps. you know, I'm, ki- I'm kind of hoping that you know. Someday they'll see something or they'll hear something and it'll just be like, right, we want that tune. Yeah. You know. What's your social media and stuff for people to tune in and see your music? So, maybe. Aye, so I've got a couple of, I've got a couple of different I've got a Facebook um page for my music which is Facebook uh, Elliot Castro mm-hmm. and it should just come it's up a there. Fucking great name, man. <laughs> great so DJ's I, I, name, great fraudster's I, I name. Used, I used to hate my name when I was younger as mm-hmm. well, you know, like fucking really didn't like it at all. But see now I kind of mm-hmm. like it. Because I thought that, I said, that must be a dummy name. That must be. Uh, you s- asked me earlier, yeah, was it my thought, real name? Yeah, I thought that was just, <laughs> just seems like a fraudster's name. It just, mm-hmm. Elliot Castro, it seems like a name you would, yeah. you would make up and put in a, a fake passport. <laughs> um, but your, all your social media uh, stuff. So so I've got my Facebook, um, I've got a SoundCloud as well, which again is soundcloud.com, Elliot Castro. And I've got Instagram as well, which is Elliot Castro with four O's at the end. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, I was raging, somebody took my name. Yeah. I was like, Have you not got a YouTube or anything up running? I've not at the moment, no. So if you're DJing, get your mm-hmm. YouTube up and running, get yeah. your videos out, are you DJing, yeah. your tunes and that? Yeah. It's just widens your audience. Absolutely. So right now I'm thinking about every avenue, how I can create income. Uh-huh. And YouTube is a great platform. It's the biggest platform, I believe, in the world just now. It's yeah. the most setting biggest, I would say. But it's a mega for you to, to get your music out there, to take it in your heights, mm-hmm. to because we spoke earlier about your yeah. social media and stuff. That's it. YouTube's a great platform. If you get a song that booms, then people go, well, who is this guy? Yeah. And it just opens other doors. So, get through then your life then, what would you <laughs> would say? How would you... How would I describe yeah, it? Yeah, just now. Right now? Yeah. I I've think. been through it all and the memories and what you've went through. Have you learnt a lot from it? I've learnt a lot, mm-hmm. man. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I've in a way, I've got to be grateful for some of the experiences that I had. You know, I, they came about through dishonesty, but I've been so lucky. I've done some things that, you know, most people will probably never get the chance to do. You know, just things like, you know, staying in all the hotel suites and mm-hmm. travelling in Concord and you know, first class limousines and all that sort of thing. But I think the other thing that's come out of it really has been that aye, these things are, are nice but they're you know, they're only part of life really, you know. Yeah. Like I've 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 kinda got to the point now where I realise that, you know, all the stuff I done when I was younger, um, it's up to me whether how or not whether, but how I let that affect me. Mm-hmm. You know? Um it's obviously caused a lot of fucking hurt to some people. Um and that's the part I feel bad about. Yeah. Um, but obviously, from my from looking at it from my own perspective as well, I've had to let go. Really, you know, because there was a time where I was just that was that was how I saw myself was that person that did all those things, mm-hmm. and now I don't see myself like that anymore. Yeah. Again, the past is a past. We can't live there. No. And I, I remember I watching the film Catch Me If You Can, Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio, and he was kidding on. He was a pilot and a judge, and yeah. that life looked glamorous. But again, he eventually gets caught. Yeah, I don't know if that was. I think that was a true story, actually. It was. Yeah, he get caught. Yeah. He ended up with the coppers. I think he got uh-huh. life, and they brought his sentence down. And it's not a glamorous life if you ain't working for it through no. just being true to you and honest. Because if yeah. it's not, then it ain't real, and it will get took away from you eventually. No mm. matter if it's fraud, drugs, or whatever you're doing, it's wrong. It will get fucking took away from you, but. For coming on today, brother, that's been fascinating, especially sitting with somebody that's just a stone's throw away in the south side. It's um, yeah. 
Usually I'm travelling up down the UK, but this one's there's no travelling. A nice easy yeah, one for you. That's an easy shift for me tonight. But would you like to finish it on anything, Elliot? No, I just uh, thanks very much for having me, mate. It's, yeah, been, no. it's been a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I know a bit more about your story mm-hmm. now as well. You know, yeah. so uh, no, I appreciate it. when I got when you got in touch. I was quite, I was quite um, mm-hmm. honoured, should I say? Yeah, you know, I appreciate. So that. thanks for having us yeah, on. No, for coming on, today, brother, it. and telling your story. Very thanks fascinating. Very I genuinely wish you all the best for the future, Thank mate. You. Keep the DJing up, and all the best, brother. Likewise, thanks, cheers, mate. Cheers. cheers. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.